podcast three and we're really excited to announce that we actually have managed to get a guest tonight. It's happened quicker than we thought, hasn't it, Pete? It has. Yeah. <laughs> and only she, she's not just like a guest that we've kind of walked outside, dragged off the street and forced to sit down by playing her with a glass of wine. <laughs> it is actually somebody of standing. It's Dr. Kerry Nixon, who is well known to anybody who loves the area of crime on TV. She's a forensic psychologist and a really well known practitioner in her field. One of the only forensic psychologists to work both academically and for the police and as well in the capacity on wards working with individuals who have been committing quite heinous crimes, mm -hmm. sorry to say. Mm -hmm. For those of you who follow Kerry and me, she's also been the voice of Britain's Darkest Taboos and takes part in lots and lots of documentaries regarding crime. Tonight we're really excited to have her, not only because we get to pick her brains on what psychopaths truly are, but also because we can find out a little bit more by prying into her private life in the hope that we can find some little specks of gold dust to make you enjoy the next hour with us. That's the intro for the last break up, guys. <laughs> Very good. Can I add anything more there, Kerry? Apart from, of course, mother. Mother. <laughs> Tired. Exhausted. <laughs> Uh, broke. <laughs> <laughs> it's after Christmas. All the best things in life. <laughs> so I thought tonight we could start by exploring a little bit about you. Because one of the things that we want to do on this podcast is kind of dig deep into just being human, making sense of all the stuff that we go through. And where better to start than with somebody who works consistently with people, their minds and emotions and what goes on within their world. But... Who is Kerry Nixon and what created the choices that you've made to end up in this crazy career? Starting from primary school age. <laughs> from primary school age, wow. Before that. <laughs> Who is Kerry Nixon? Well, I've always been a bit of a nightmare, so my mother tells me. Um, I was the kid that got into trouble for talking, for being opinionated. Uh, <laughs> For, I, I remember one teacher saying to me, if you put as much effort into talking into your studies, you'd be a grade A student. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was just the life and soul, really. I've always have been chatty and opinionated. Nothing much has changed there. And um, I had a difficult start in some ways. Um, my mum struggled financially. Uh, we, my mum's a single mum. Yeah. I uh, don't have really I don't have a relationship with my father, um, so I probably I'm, I'd say probably a bit of a tough cookie, and that's because of the values that my mum taught me, and we yeah. did have a really tough start in life. Um, but I think that's taught me resilience and strength, and to not give up, which you need in this career. Um, in terms of in primary school, I think that probably the first sign that I would go into a job like this not that I wanted to do a job like this then, was I persuaded my mum at the age of, when I was 10, to subscribe to Murder in Mind. <laughs> and it was going to go one of two ways here. Eh? She's it either going to actually be a professional <laughs> practitioner or she might end up in prison. Exactly. I think she was a bit worried. <laughs> you might have been undecided yeah. at that point. Which way do I go? She subscribed to what? Murder in Mind. It was a magazine. I thought you, you, know what I thought you said? I thought you said Marjorie Mind. <laughs> I was thinking some sort of BBC Radio 4... Marjorie Mind. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Marjorie yeah. Mind. Murder in Mind, which I think... The show where we can... I think it was every fortnight. And every fortnight was a different serial killer. I love it. And it was like this wallet, and inside there was a magazine, there was pictures, there was posters, you could do things. And I would think number one was Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh my God, Dahmer. And do you know what? Do you know I only threw them out, I think, about... Four years ago. I love the fact that whilst most ten-year-olds are collecting Barbie stickers for those amazing books that you'd always never be able to get number 33 and that kid in your class whose parents were rich and sent off for them always used yeah. to upset you and you were actually going, ah, oh, could go yeah. for Barbie, could go for Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. Seems like a plausible and suggestion. Every, you know, one. <laughs> every single one. I think it went up to something like 40. And wow. every single 40 serial killers. I didn't even know they did these magazines. Yeah, loved it. Murder in mind. I always Murder remember mind. the news agent looking at us really, like, worryingly. Like, yes. This child's doing subscribing to like, this. Backing off behind the counter, <laughs> removing the sharp objects. 
I didn't kill animals or anything like that. <laughs> it was, so you know, it was gonna, I was in bed where after like, or set fire to it had, fires. It was gonna go either one of two ways, wasn't it? Was. It? it was either gonna go the way you'd gone or yeah. Interestingly, murderer. the teacher said that to me. Um, <laughs> when you were talking too much. Yeah. 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 It was um, I think it was the end of primary school and the, it was the deputy head, Mr. Bruce, I remember him. And he said to my mum, she's either going to do really well in life or she's going to be a complete <laughs> dropout. So. <laughs> did he say dropout or did he say murderer? <laughs> I didn't quite use that word, that's probably what he was thinking. Um, but yeah, what no, was it that kind of like inspired you about those particular, what was it that sparked that interest into let's think about Jeffrey Dahmer might have fed my neighbours to various people, you know, that kind of thing. I think, I think even then I was really interested and obviously I didn't know, I didn't know anybody who was a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I was born to a mum who, you know, had left school at 14, yeah. who yeah, worked is, as a telephonist. Yeah. Um, she was a hard worker, she, like, she worked, she wanted to be at home with me but because she was a single mum she took a job where she worked all night, so she'd wow. work all night, come home at 8 o'clock in the morning, take me to school and be there to pick me up from school but then go to work and work wow. all night. Um, and so I, I wasn't around professionals in that way, so I never got any introduction, but it was some interest in what makes somebody do that kind of thing. I just, I don't know, I just had this innate interest in it, I don't know where it came from. Um, and my mum, interestingly, later on in life, skipping a, a, a bit here, but she ended up putting herself into university in her 40s and became a social worker in wow. her 40s. So then I was probably introduced to it then, that's how later on in life I, I knew what to do. But growing up in, in senior school, I won, again, this is probably where my path went more to succeeding. Yeah. Um, at the age of 11, when you go into um, senior school, there was the local comp, which, great, lots of people did really well there. I probably wouldn't have done mm. it because of my character, because of the way yeah. I was. I probably would have got too trouble. busy killing animals. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and my mum happened to be friends with a woman who um, had a daughter in a private school. Yeah. And that was a world away from my mum's, you know, income bracket. Sure. Income bracket. Um, but she, I don't know how she even managed it, but she got me into a, um, a tutor. And I ended up winning a place, and I, like um, an assisted place, a scholarship to this school. So she, and that probably changed my life because even though I still messed around, <laughs> I still still got into lots of trouble. Teachers always remember me. They see me now. They remember me, which is hiding kind of behind fairies. Yeah. Oh my god, it's Terry so, Nixon. Yeah. Um, so they they, I think it was it was just something that was in me. And then when I got a place in a good school. I was able to, even though I messed around, get good grades. Sure. But then I didn't want to. I didn't. I still didn't really know about. I wanted to be an actress. I love that. And I. That's what but I, I, but I think that I do think that you know there's some real synergy between what actors are and what psychologists Absolutely. are because I think that natural empathy that you have to kind of. Obviously, not everyone has natural empathy. Not a lot of practitioners often have it, but when you truly do, it's that ability to walk into somebody else's shoes, and I think that that's absolutely an example of what actors do. Absolutely, and also, <coughs> I was talking actually, I was giving a, a, a talk yesterday to some budding psychologists, and I said it's come full circle in lots of ways, because I wanted to be an actress, I went to drama school, yeah, wow. I was going in London for a bit, um, decided that I actually couldn't cope with the life of being out of work, the inconsistency, I, I didn't see, like what I was seeing around me, so I left, did a, started a degree in drama, hated it, because I preferred drama school, but I couldn't stay, mm. um, and that's how I then ended up, I decided to do psychology. Um, and then, obviously, years later, as you said, it helps with, I ended up doing media work, so it helps with that, it helps when you give evidence in court. Sure, it's a really good point, actually. You know, distance yourself yeah. in some way when you're absolutely terrified. And the power beneath your words yeah. is really important. Like the yeah. way you, I think that that's one of the things that people underestimate, and that's why really convincing liars are convincing. 
you know, all of this stuff around people making eye contact and that's honest or dishonest, you know, all of those kind of myths to some degree. Yeah. What actually really counts is delivery. Yeah. If you deliver in a way that sounds like you are authentically sorry or you're authentically innocent or authentic in any way, you just buy into it, don't yeah. you? And actually, like you said, to some degree, that's why we've seen people in crime get away literally yeah. with murder because of delivery. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm not that you're, you know, yeah. not that I'm bringing that I'm into the yeah, Having said all that, I love that leading. Yeah. I'm actually really bad at lying because what I do is when I know I'm lying, I I over I, I give more information than I need, and I end up just looking like a liar. So I'm actually really bad liar. Um, but I use it a lot when I'm with. I'm actually sat here thinking, Dr. <laughs> Kerry Nixon, is she, is, she, is she clever enough to go down that second route instead of the first one, thinking that if I go on this route, then I can tend to be a I'm doctor. I'm completely confused end, by it. Yeah, I can become an actual really good serial killer and pretend I'm not very good at acting, but what I'm really at is I'm really good at acting. Yeah. Right? I, I, don't know. I thought I knew you, Kerry. I thought Dexter. I knew you. And I was starting to think, <laughs> she's one of the best serial killers ever. Although that is a jest, but you never no. know. No, no, no. But no. you know, with like, you know, Could just you stop there a second? Yeah, first of all, it's my phone. No, no, it's not. No, so we were, it's these two. I can hear it constantly. It's going to be on the mic. It's oh. calling to the fat mess and fighting and banging. Oh, no. Guys, you do realize we're recording here. Listen, it's absolutely ridiculous what you're doing. I'm sat there and all I can hear, and I, can, I know I can hear it all. Can you tell them to well. go to bed, Pete? Because it's time for them to go to bed now. Didn't you hear them? Absolutely going mental out here. And it's been picked up. I didn't hear that, darling. All right, well, I did. I did. I did. We're in the middle of recording. Well, you've, you've just been doing the first 20 minutes, just going to bed. Give him his phone. Just hope he just gets on top of it. I heard that as well, Evan. I heard it on the microphone, mate. Well, you're not to know that. We are in the middle of recording here. It's just not fair, it's that, is it? I know, he's, he's going to get, <laughs> believe it when he finishes, he's going to be in trouble late tomorrow morning. Let's go for all the instances. Just trying to ignore him, Tide. Literally, I've been sat there just like, and all I could hear was bang, 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 that mess, you done. It was just like, it was just. I did hear. I was waiting to the point to just to go and stop the door, didn't you? Yeah. You were busy talking. I, I was just, sat yeah, all I, I could hear was them. Just banging and banging okay, and banging. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah, so I had to stop it where... Yeah, that's fine. So I was going to say... Mm. I was going to say, um, this is what I wanted to pick up on. So when you're watching or hearing about series like Dexter, mm -hmm. just to pick up on that point because you just brought it in, mm -hmm. how do you kind of feel about that? I haven't actually, I've only, I think I've seen one or two episodes, I've yeah. never actually watched it. So I, I know that, is he a psychiatrist? Or yeah, it's like a professional in the field. But and he also, kills serial killers, yeah. or he kills bad people. Isn't that insane though? I thought he was just a serial killer. Or does he have a it reason? Meant to be, you couldn't yeah. create, look, you could not create a series where there was no morality based <laughs> the action of that individual yeah. who's perpetrating horrendous murders. But that really strikes the chord with me. This idea of justifiable killing that there is an okay killing type, you know? How does that feel for you? Like, because you work in a field where you must constantly come across people who just genuinely want to murder the people who hurt their families, for example. I, well, I come across lots. I come across people where have, not that you understand it. No. That you understand Empathize. where the motivation has come from. Yeah. Um, and then you come across people who murder people and there's just no understanding. Yeah. Like people who kill children, for example, Ugh. strangers. Um, for me, no. I am a, a very non-violent mm. person who <clears throat> I can't imagine. The only, if you're saying what is justifiable, mm. and I would say that this is justifiable from a personal point of view, but not justifiable from a societal point of view, that if anybody harmed my child, I'd want to kill them. Mm. Yeah. But do I believe in the death penalty? No. Because that's my decision that's it's born out of my emotion. Yes. I would want to hunt down and kill the person who hurt my child or my loved one. Absolutely. But I wouldn't want us to live in a society that condone that. That condone that. It's because then we've lost it. Yeah. Then we're living in a society where there's, you know, what is the price of life? I agree. And it's born out of, I've got every right to hate the person who had potentially done something to mm. my loved ones. Mm. 
but I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want a society to do that. I think that one of the most challenging experiences as a practitioner is being able to balance the emotional discourse that's created when you think about somebody harming your children. Because I can believe that I'm a compassionate healer to some mm-hmm. degree. <clears throat> I can utilise things like the core conditions of unconditional positive regard, empathy, congruence. But the minute that I imagine somebody either sexually abusing or killing my child, the rage that I feel is incandescent and completely at a juncture to how I feel about human life in general. You know, I'm a vegetarian, so life per se. And it's the one moment where I think you hold a mirror to your potential. Because I think in life, we all kind of go around thinking that we know who we are. And for example, I could not kill somebody in my right mind. I know that I could not do that unless I was protecting my own life and my children's life in that moment. But when I think about somebody perpetuating a crime against my own children and harming them, I go into a completely different, almost like a systematic shift where I don't just imagine being rageful and retaliating. I imagine wanting to torture and break that person and it's so distinguishable from who I am as a what I would say well-adjusted normal human being who's functioning I don't know how you feel you're obviously a dad what do you feel as a man because I don't know how it feels to be paternal I know how it feels to be maternal I like literally feel like my life's blood is connected to those boys I think you know the answer to this one (laughs) um yeah I I mean I'm I'm not I'm not really for the death penalty um Mm. I'd rather the people who've committed these crimes live the life out in such a way that, you know, they hate it, you know, because sometimes you think it's the You're easy going way. straight for the Russian prisons. Well, yeah, it's the easy way out, isn't it? You know, I'd rather see them, I'm not some, oh, hard, I don't know if they say hard labour, it's not like it's not, you know, the World War One anymore, is it? You know, but I'm talking, you know, make them hate their lives to a point, you know, where they deserve that, they deserve wouldn't say torture because that's like going as far as to kill people as well isn't it you know but and we don't I, I just don't believe in society because yeah. then we go to countries where you know I'm not going to name countries but we all know countries where you know they chop people's hands off and they torture people and they have stonings and I don't want to be part of that no no no, no. Even, I'm, if I'm, some, I'm, even if somebody deserves to be tortured for what they've done yeah. out of emotion I don't want to be part of a society that condones that type of behaviour because what we actually do in a society like that is we produce more of them That's yeah. exactly we produce yeah. people who don't love and care and I have a real and a lot of people call me naive I have a real belief in kindness and mm. people just caring for each other and even though I hear all the time from people saying you know, life is horrible now. We live in a horrible society, but actually, every day, you see kindness. You see good goodness in people. Oh yeah, yeah, I get that. And I, just, um, I, I wouldn't want a society that we punish in that way. Yeah. Yes, I agree. And I've always said this because I think sometimes there's the image that psychologists are fluffy and they can solve the world and everybody is safe. I'm married to Emma, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married to Emma, I know exactly that it's all fluffy and she can solve the world. Exactly. Although she, I think she can solve the world. <laughs> but I know, I, there's people that I know, mm. you know, I know I'm not going to fix them. Yeah. Yes. I know that unfortunately we got to them too late. Yeah. yeah. And I know there's people who deserve to serve the rest of their life in prison. And I believe in whole life tariffs. Yeah. I do. That's, that's, that's what I mean. <coughs> the the right give... person, yeah. I believe in whole life tariffs. <coughs> I do think that some people can commit murder and deserve a second chance. Yes. It depends on the type yes. of murder, mm. the conditions of the yes. murder, what led to the murder, what condition they have. Have they got mental illness? Was it born out of something? So we can't make a sweeping generalisation. Every murder means whole life tariff. It's whole life tariff should be used for the cases yeah. that it it suits. Well, well, going back to going back to what I'd feel as a dad, if someone did something to my kids, have you ever seen the film Law Abiding Citizen? Yes. Well, that's all. Yeah. yeah. If anybody's seen the film Law Abiding Gerard Citizen, Butler. Gerard Butler. Basically, his wife and child um, are murdered, mm. and so he plots this incredible revenge on the guys yeah. who were all involved in it, yeah. and does everyone it in an amazing <laughs> way. But the whole premise is that is what we were talking about then, which is born out of revenge from yeah. the deep, guttural, cerebral pain of loss. I'm not sure but, that I, I'm not sure as a person I would be able to 
sit back uh, if something really happened to my children sit back and let the people <coughs> who did it I'd, if, if, they, if they didn't get to justice I'll, I'd, I'd do all I could to get them to justice yeah, you know, I'd I'd not saying I'd go out and yeah. set fire to them or yeah. you know drown them in a bucket of you know, yeah. urine, you know what I mean just I'd like you went straight for the bucket of urine like you just go <laughs> to water, in a bucket of urine you know. leading on from the falling over and drowning in the in the toilet full of <laughs> wee and poo they would yeah, do that on the first yeah, podcast yeah. I believe there's a theme there's a theme <laughs> um, yeah, I'd want them to serve justice because I also even though I talk about wanting to hunt down somebody who had harmed a loved one I, I can't imagine me ever being able to do that act of taking somebody's life no. but that's you the hear about people yeah. you hear about these kids now who are stabbing each other over oh, no. the most petty things and I just the fact that they plunge a knife into somebody else and take another person's life I, I can't imagine ever doing that but I know yeah. that the pain as you said I can't even go there I mean what people yeah. think of, it's completely unrelated to what we're talking about but I've just thought about it people find it really bizarre about me some of my friends and family find it bizarre that the things I listen to on a day-to-day basis, the most heinous crimes, you know, sex crime, murder, child murder. Do you know what I can't watch? I can't watch any advert on a childhood illness. Yes. I can't. I, I can't watch Child in Need. I can't, on social media, if there's any kind of advert about anything to do with a childhood illness, I can't watch. I can't. And, but I can listen to... No, I get it. But I, I completely get that, though, because there is the potential of our children to be touched by that. And the worst part is there, you cannot have rage against something that isn't palpable exactly. in the way that you would have as a person. And there's no control. It's well. absolutely... I, I feel mean, like you can somehow protect yes. my loved ones from... Of course, you can't but, always No, protect, but I get it. But I feel like I can at least try to, whereas you can't with no. disease. It can hit anybody at any time. And I also think that there is that, that part, the, the same part that makes me imagine ripping somebody to pieces if they touched a hair on my child's head. You know, yeah. that absolute, like I say, cerebral oh, level yeah. of rage. And I actually do feel that I'm happy, like you said, that the environment I've been brought up in is one where we have a legal system that says that people like me are not allowed to make those decisions when Absolutely. something like that happens oh. because I need that protection because I actually unlike you I can imagine killing somebody who harmed my children and I'm thankful that nobody would allow that to occur yeah. because I'm that person who thinks I'd sit in jail I could imagine, happy I could that imagine I've done killing it. somebody yeah it's when I actually think of the physical act of yeah watching somebody's but I know that if it Let's do it from afar. If I, sp- if I spend time thinking about yes, then the actual very physical intimacy of it. I, I'm, for goodness sake, I'm trying to slightly you know? bullying my child. <laughs> and I want to yeah, those I moments. Want to repair. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. It's so strange. You know, I'm starting to get angry just by the thought. Yeah. Of this. Do you know what? Though? That is so true. You do you start getting angry thinking about it because it's all about justice. It's all about justice, and it's that morality of justice. And it's like you said with the illness. Then mm. when we as mothers imagine anything stealing the one thing that let's be honest enables our happiness because i was kind of gestating on this the other day i was really kind of thinking it's kind of like both pregnant and empty and my thoughts all in the same moment i was just imagining imagining kind of what it's like to not have kids it was just like this moment where i was kind of playing with my own head because i was thinking about like love and grief and loss and the human journey and the inevitability of sadness you know my parents are going to die it's going to be really really painful my best friends died it has been really really painful there is this absolute as i said inevitability of loss and pain and then i started to play with the idea of well you know if i had never had children and i was just like in a relationship with my husband and we were just kind of progressing through life traveling distracting ourselves with things because we've got more money because we've not ruined our lives by spending it all on the children and forever But, you know, I was kind of thinking of that more selfish gratification. And there was a little bit in my head going, wow, that would have been so less painful than the one you chose. Yet at the same moment, there was this part of me that's like, the only good thing I ever did was have kids. The only thing that I ever had any meaning with is kids. I remember my mum saying something to me that I didn't understand because she said it to her before I had a child. And she said that the overriding emotion she felt 
when she gave birth to me was fear. Mm, my mum said exactly the same, worry. Yeah. She's, fear, how can I love somebody so much? Yeah, yeah. And it's like when I've got friends who haven't had children, they say, oh, I can imagine what it's like. And I, and oh I, and I would have said the same before I took Yeah, you, you can't. can't. You can't, you can't imagine what it's like. You it's can't. all encompassing. It's fear, it's love, it's adoration, it's every emotion you can imagine. And it's just a consistent knowledge that they are your everything mm -hmm. and that, that you will never be theirs. That's another thing I've had to really start coming to terms to. It. I'm sure that you as a mum knows exactly how that feels. Your daughter's younger than my boys, but one of the things that I'm really working on is the grief of that acceptance that my boys are kind of like never going to need me how I need them because they're kids and they're going to grow up and they're going to fall in love hopefully and they're going to have their own kids and their own kids will mean more than I will mean and their own wife will mean more or husband or whatever they end up with will mean more than I and that is such a stark brutality of the parenting journey because when they're kids like you know when you arrived in our lives because obviously you're a stepdad and you've been there since they were very young you acclimatized to them as children and you remember when we could just like make everything all right with a cookie and an ice yeah. cream and and their yeah. whole world was all they adore you the whole they world. adore you everything it's like it's adoration and I just, this you are the most important person yeah. in the world the narcissism prevails <laughs> i think i remember reading something on social media and it was about um the last time they fall asleep on your chest the last time you're breastfeeding the last time this and when you're in it you don't recognize it but now that some of those things have ended oh yeah i'm like oh god that will never happen again yeah i think about the oh. ghosts of my children all the time i literally leaving my old house when we moved one of the big things that i've had to kind of grieve is the fact that i don't see that environment that they used to run through and the garden that was really crap and small but nonetheless they used to exist in and i think that it's been a real sense of coming to for me recently yeah. a sense of grief do you think you'll have any more children, just as a side note, now we're talking about little kids? I know, and I was being a woman of a certain age, you're still young. young. <laughs> no, you're still young, you know, you've still got the time. <laughs> How does it feel, because you've got one child and yet you're somebody that I consider is like massively maternal. Do you know what, um, it's, it's, I had my child quite late, not necessarily, but you know, late 30s, yeah. uh, 36, and... Mainly a child. But it's, it's you know, it's... It's not late now no. for a lot of professional women, in particular. Mm. You know, and I think professional women, it's the average age is something like thirty-seven. Yeah, years absolutely. Um, however, it in terms of having more children, I also divorced my husband when my daughter was months old. Well, I left him when she was months old, and I think what happened then, because I and I wasn't interested in, I was just focused on me and my child and and getting myself back together. I knew that I wouldn't go back into another relationship for any time soon. And I had an agony for having another mm. child. I mean, I ate I get it. for another child. It was all consuming. Yeah. And I think it was in some ways because I couldn't. Yeah. If I'd still been in a marriage, maybe it wouldn't have been all as, sure. as, as such a huge thing for me. But, um, and to the point where I even started looking into sperm donors. And then I got to the point where I kind of came full circle and got had peace with, actually. I couldn't have the lifestyle I have with my daughter if I was bringing up another child on my own wage, with no support, no help, and it would be harder. And I kind of got, I came to, no, I'm okay. Teachers empowered us to do anything we wanted so the opposite of what you're saying in terms of working class a school that kind of limits people but in some ways and this isn't you know if I talked to teachers from my school I wouldn't I wouldn't say that this was wrong because I think it was right for the yeah. time however nobody ever said to us think about the ticking clock think yeah. about the future and I think something that's what we need to think about now is I want my daughter to have a career. I want her to be in. I don't want her to ever have to rely on a man if she was in an unhappy relationship. Yeah. I want her to be able to be able to get out. Self sustained. Self sustained. However, you need to have one eye on. We, you're not fertile forever, and that's as you said. Yeah. Where women are different to men. Men can have babies until they're eighty. Yeah. Women, it starts to drop off in their late thirties. It's such and an inequality. On who, it is, 
And you have to think, if you're having a great career and then you think, and it's happened to so many people I know, yeah. I'm ready to have children now. Oh, can't. Can't. And also, there is this real myth, and like it gets peddled all the time, as a woman who's suffered with infertility my whole <coughs> life, you know, the myth is that, well, you can just freeze your eggs, or you can... Doesn't, just, how doesn't. expensive is... Well, I mean, how, how expensive is that freezing wise? eggs actually isn't still today. It's getting better, but yeah. there's not that many live births from freezing eggs. Freezing embryos yes. is more successful. But to go through freezing... Uh, you're basically going through IVF to freeze an embryo, yeah. and then... The emotional impact of that, what do you do with them if you don't use them? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they, exactly. they bluntly ask you, do you want to donate it to science? <sighs> do you want to give it to somebody else? Or do you want us to put it in the bin? I mean, but it's that whole kind of experience that, one, there's a further inequality because poverty would stop you from even having that option. Absolutely. But I kind of like think that, as you noted, that women these days, they were, we peddled this idea that we've got all these options but when you actually examine it closely, you kind of see that very often our options have been diminished because you have to select. Yeah. So again, no disrespect to men because I adore men and I would not have it any other way that I was with a man. Um, but when I think about men full stop and your options, like another option is the fact that, you know, you go into your career, you work, you might have a wife or partner, same sex partner or otherwise, you have children. And then you can guarantee in the relationship between men and women, 98% of the time it's a woman who stays at home. And that isn't not wanted, because I would have stayed at home forever. But the point is, it's not really that much of an option, because fundamentally society is geared up so that the men go back to work and the woman stays at home. So again, it's like reductive, the opportunities. And whilst I'm really happy to be a free woman living in the UK, because I'm bloody mm -hmm. lucky, and... I was born to nice parents, which makes me even luckier, and I've got a lovely husband and nice kids. So that makes me lucky, all those things. But you can't help but... And it is about going, but I want more! But it's that sense of, I would like to have had the same options as men. Absolutely. And also, I don't think you, as a woman, what we come, came, came back to before, you can't prepare yourself to how you feel as a mother. No! So I remember, and I always remember a fantastic um, assistant chief constable that I was working with um, when I was pregnant. Um, and she's an amazing woman, amazing woman, um, and she's now, um, I, I can't remember her title, Dean of a College in Oxford or something, she's retired, she's amazing, and she said she had two children, and she said to me, you, you can't prepare yourself, you are a career woman, and it's going to hit you hard, because you still think that you can control everything, and it will be, just have to go with it, and I didn't listen to it at first. I was still, I was, I'd given birth and I was sending text messages because I was still working on a case. And it took me a few weeks to actually be like, oh my goodness, this has changed my entire life. It's, it's, I'm never going to feel this way about anything. work, about anything again. And prior to having my child, I was like, well, I can go back to work. And my husband at the time can, but no, suddenly I want to breastfeed. I want to be with my child. And so you, you can't prepare for what, how your life no, changes. No. And that's something they don't tell you at school either. Especially my school, it's a school for girls. It was all girls. None of that. No. I mean, I don't think you can teach that, but at least maybe a little bit of a think about balancing yeah. it somehow. Yeah. We didn't have any of that. It was like succeed, 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 career, career, career. You kind of carry the weight of achievement, don't you? You carry yeah. the weight of expectation and there's almost like a feeling that if you don't manage to do what you think you should be because you've been told you should be it, that you somehow intrinsically failed. Absolutely. And often you don't realise that you're just experiencing this whole blueprint mentality where somebody's forged this identity with what you think your life should be as Absolutely. opposed to what it really is. And nobody goes, just do it your way. Just go, go ahead, just... Do it yeah. your way. It might be completely different from the next person. Don't compare yourself as long as you're okay and happy. Yeah, we all compare, don't we? Yeah. We all compare. Well, even in academia. Until we stop comparing. Yeah. Is we're never really truly happy. Yeah. And I think another thing that we've missed here is that all of this is dependent on what you've just raised with, with P, mm. is having a good partner. Yeah. Like, all of that. Yeah. I bought him. Is, he, was, uh, he was on a male, male website for uh, import brides and grooms. But if you yeah. haven't well, got well, 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 He imported me from, from Saltburn. Yes, right? you're in the dinted tin section. Yeah. With I, the know, style. I want to go straight for them. I want to go straight for Teesside. 
I fancy someone with a bit of an accent. Not as strong as Newcastle or Sunderland. I don't want to be like, we oh, yeah, man. I want to be a bit more, how does it go, Emma? How does my accent sound? I got you with three for two. Did you? Where's the yeah, other two? I love the way you're deflecting. Where's the other two? She's just deflecting. <laughs> she's just deflecting that because she can't do my accent. She's really good at wait, accents. Wait. The only accent that she cannot do is a Middlesbrough accent. I can do accents. Because it always goes into it. Sarah Millican. Yeah. Whenever I do it, I start talking like that. That's Welsh. No way, she's like that. <laughs> I used to live in Wales. That's oh, Welsh. I can do Welsh. The, not the a Sarah Millican is, is her go-to. Go go no, no, I try and be, I, I try and be your mum, I'm like, I'm like, oh, Pete, I don't know why, I don't know why you... Yeah, Sarah Millican, yeah. No, because Sarah Millican, Sarah Millican's... Uh, what is she Chinese? Well, yeah. she Chinese? No, I'm yeah. not doing that, I'm not appropriating. No, this is you sort of like, you're like... I'm trying to be Sarah Millican, can yeah. you do it? No. No, what is it? I'm really like bad Sarah at Sarah Millican always stop. talks about things like, this is so going off track, but she always goes like, you know, <laughs> well, me boyfriend, oh, me boyfriend, well, I like chocolate, I like chocolate, I'm going to get some that's like, chocolate. That's like Irish, Welsh, a little bit of Scouser, a North thing, like, no, can, no Middlesbrough accent I can whatsoever. I do Irish and I can do Welsh and I can do There's Spanish. a video on the internet that shows a guy saying about the Middlesbrough accent where people say butter, it's butter. Butter. That's Newcastle. Butter. That's Newcastle. I'm going on a shop and get some butter. That's Newcastle. From your mum. No, that's, it's not. It's, it's a, not Newcastle. Is that from Newcastle? A little bit of scouse maybe as well. Yeah. Like, I, I can do that. I'm really good at that. <laughs> that's good. That's really like, good. Like, serious. Like, I can't do, like, your, like, area, which is the posh area, but I can do my area, no problem. Where's your area? Like, common. <laughs> the common? <laughs> like, like, people like I me up there. I mentioned the common. I used to play on the common. When I was a kid, so you were from where that place is where you find porno mags. Uh, honestly, <laughs> you've gone into some cerebral area of your own existence. I'm not. The first podcast we did, we talked about, about porn where porn I magazines. played, and it was the common. <laughs> you just said you live on the common. Now, do you know how this starts as I well? I was talking about good common. partners. You yeah. kind of ruined yeah. the image here, Pete. <laughs> I know. Seriously, porn magazines and the common. Yeah. Anyway, back yeah, to I was saying that <laughs> all of this coming back to feminism. Not that we have to depend on a man. This is why she does TV, because she's good at picking <laughs> up on people's detractions from where we're going. Just little tangents. <laughs> little tangents. It wasn't a little, it was little. Yeah, but not, not that it's about relying on a man. No. We, we're both feminists. We're both no, very... So, wouldn't it? No. <laughs> you know, reverse that. I rely on a woman, so... <laughs> exactly. You know, you know not, it's not, not about to... relying. However, for the first time in my entire life, I'm now dating a nice man and it really makes nice the man. world of difference I think it makes you be able to be man. just yourself to as you said equal it's not yeah. about relying no. it's not about needing no. it's not about it's about two wanting. together inviting. people yes on their own who are happy and dependent independent yeah <laughs> not dependent independent oh it's a coming together a bit of dependence is okay bit of dependency. Though, isn't it? And it's, it makes the world a difference and it enables, and I've realised realize how much it enables you to do things. Yes. When you're dealing with toxic relationships, yeah. that limits you. Coming back to the limit point, how many people in your life, throughout your life, limit you? Yeah. And negative relationships, yeah. toxic relationships, yeah. limit you. you. You can never reach your full potential if you're in a toxic relationship. You said earlier on as well, just before we were just having a natter as we were catching up, you said um, about the fact that what has changed for you is that the things that you would once have found non-attractive in a relationship with a man, you now realise are wholly attractive. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit more about, because I really connected with that. I think, and this is born out of what I briefly mentioned, is when I had a conversation today with a colleague and it was about what makes you who you are. Yeah. And she talked about a negative relationship with her father, negative relationship with the stepfather, which led to many negative relationships with intimate partners. And that's kind of the pattern for me, yeah. really. And I was attracted to a type of man that was almost like a rescuer that was going to solve my problems, and they made me feel fantastic, and it was all this, oh, I feel great, and I'm up here. And then because they treated me badly... I felt down here. Yeah. 
and then they did something nice and I felt up here it's again. It's like a cycle of ups and, it's and downs. cycle and it was, it, was, it was addictive in many ways and it was all that I'd ever probably, I think a lot of women who've been through that and it's very common to have that background. And that all consuming versus abandonment. You know, that yes. constant cycle of, oh my God, I'm the most important person in the world, so I'm a piece of shit. Yeah. Don't leave me, don't yeah. leave me. Yeah, I'm desperate, I'm yeah. desperate. Tell me, tell me I'm for yeah. worth, yeah. And then to to leave the a negative marriage. Yeah. And then it was very different for me because it was, I'm now a mother and I'm a hair role model. I'm strong. And I'm strong. And I left and I stayed away, even though, you know, it, I was in a situation where I could have easily gone back yeah. and I didn't. Yeah. And it's the best, best. I knew it was the best thing. It's amazingly empowering, actually, what you've just said, though, that kind of protective mechanism that comes in in that moment where you have made that absolute decision to call that negative relationship. Yeah. And I think that what you're describing there is that almost creeping, austere experience of realising that you are better than. But instead of it being one where it's like, I mean, in the healing process, yeah, so yeah. that gestation point where you kind of feel like I can do this on my fucking own. And almost like as opposed to that open compassion that you would usually exhibit, it's like you close it down and you're like, no fucker is ever going to make me feel that way again. Absolutely. And no fucker is going to hurt yeah. my child. Or, exactly. And I am, I can do this. And yeah. My mum was that, but my mum didn't have what I had. She, she gave me by getting me to a private school, giving me the tools, me having... So I remember th it hit me really one day when I was thinking about, God, my mum went through what I'm going through now. Yeah. But she was 10 years younger and she had no qualifications. She wasn't a professional. And she wasn't right. professional. And it was suddenly like, wow, mm -hmm. what she went through. And what she did for me. Massive respect. Huge respect. Yeah. And leaving, it was, it was the best thing I've ever done. And I went through years of horrific things, um, but always knowing that I'd made the right decision yeah. and deliberately stayed out of a relationship. It was me and my daughter, didn't need anything yeah. else, focus back on me. Yeah. And I think because it's that old cliche, you can't be happy in a relationship mm -hmm. until you're happy on yourself. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, you know what? I've still got some problems, I've still got things that I've got to deal with, Nothing, no life is ever perfect. But I was like, I'm actually happy. Oh yeah. I'm actually happy. And not long after that, you met her. I, I met my, yeah, my we, current partner. We had a conversation, so me and Pete, I was on my own for five years. before. Five, me. Yeah, five years, yeah. I was with me, five, five years. years. Yeah. And um, I just embraced it. And we often talk about the fact that there was, I had a particular client a long time ago and she said to me, um, you know, I'm just terrified that I'm going to be that old lady with cats who grows old with cats. Yeah. And synonymously, in that moment, I said, and Jess, we had a thing going, that's my dream. <laughs> and literally, I heard it. I was like, oh my God, why are you afraid of that? That's my dream. I'm going to be the woman who gets discovered two weeks after all. She's died and she's made by half of them. You know, that was my dream. Yeah. And there was like one night, <laughs> true though, isn't it? I've said that. It's a massive thing. Yeah. And then one night, I had been thinking about, I'd been doing a lot of contemplation. I, when me and my ex-husband, when I asked him to leave after his affair, I genuinely started to think like about getting to know myself. I think, as you'll know, when you've been in a relationship that's quite, for you, toxic, for me, apathetic. So almost equally as toxic in the fact that there's so little there. Mm -hmm. When I ceased to have that, I also learned that I'd lost myself. I'd become so invisible. I'd kind of lost myself bit by bit to a point where I was nobody. I did. Yeah. Yeah, so I did. So I spent these like years like kind of putting back the pieces and mm -hmm. like one, actually kind of like liking myself like yeah. kind of like be like whoa i actually i actually quite i quite yeah. like myself you know going through the sexual revolution of just thinking hey i'm gonna open myself up to loads of sexual experiences and, and with respect i embrace every single one of them because it kind of let me lose my shame mm -hmm. and helped me to see that sex was just a thing i know that sounds ridiculous but i kind of always built sex up to be like this really important thing and then mm -hmm. it was tied in with lots of shit from my childhood and it was so liberating to let that go. But then I got to this point where I almost went, I suppose, homeostasis is a word that I could 
use, which is almost like the, the state of being uh, almost um, like closed, where I'd become safe and I felt happy and I wasn't being sexually liberated anymore and I wasn't needing to go out and I was, I was very much content, like I'd reached mm-hmm. this really content stage, but I was just like, this is going to be me forever. And then I'd, I'd been talking to somebody and somebody said to me, you know what, Emma, you should just like always be open. And it's ridiculous because you and Noah and I know that we always kind of think we know exactly what we need to hear because mm-hmm. that's what we do all the time, most of the time. That's true. Yeah. But in this moment, that person just said, you know, I just think like maybe you just need to be open. And I went to bed that night and I was in a bunk bed, ironically, because as a parent like yourself, who's a bit of an attachment parent, mm-hmm. I got to the point where my eldest child, who was like, you know, like seven, shall we say, or eight, no, probably nine, had wanted to sleep in my bed and my youngest child wanted to sleep in the bunk bed. So I would sleep in the bunk beds on the bottom bunk. It was wonderful. But what I remember was I went to bed this night and I think I'd had a drink and I just laughed. And I was, as you know, I don't have a faith in any religion. I have a massive faith in something. I don't know what that is. I certainly talk every night to what I consider a creator. I don't know what that is, but it makes me feel better. I'm sticking with it. And I went to bed and I just said, all right, okay. I'll be open. And that's all I said. And I laughed. And I remember going to bed and just laughing and going, I'll be open. And he called me that Saturday. Okay, he may have called me to tell me that his marriage had ended and that he was distressed. But always the option, you know, oh, single man, brilliant. Got on with him very well. Um, and it wasn't in the therapeutic context. It's just I was always nice to people when we worked and he happened to get my number because I would sort his head out. And I actually put the phone down on that Saturday morning after I'd told him, as you can imagine, with my direct empathy, oh, get yourself together. She's had an affair. You're well rid. That's kind of the advice. It didn't, you know, kind of went exactly like that, actually. I said, I said, she saved your time. <laughs> yeah. Why would you want to be wasting your life with a woman who doesn't appreciate you? You know, move on. And I put the phone down and I just thought when I put the phone down, there's a story here. And I can, I can genuinely remember putting that phone down. I'd never had a long conversation with him before. I said hi to him, you know, it was cute. Yeah. And I put the phone down and I sat on the floor in my bedroom, in my bedroom that was decorated like it was a caravan. Because Pete... I can vouch for that. ...insisted that when he moved in that it'd be ripped out. It literally was like the guy had gone in <laughs> to, a, to a place and said, what I'd really like is one of those kind of caravan looks with the uh, fitted furniture and the two lamps with the pink shades by the side. And he'd got that perfectly. I sat on the floor in that incredibly attractive room and I just thought there's a story here. And within three months we'd moved in with each other, but it was the openness. It was getting out of that, that almost... Um, yeah, that almost chrysalis state of safety mm-hmm. and being willing to believe that I could and somebody else could meet in the middle. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like that's where you are at right now yeah. with this guy. Yeah, no, and it's we're just enjoying it and it's nice and it's 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 different for both of us and we knew each other for a while, a good long time before we got together. Um, and I just don't think we were both in that space and then we were. And it coincided at the same time, which I think is, is, again, a big part of it. I think so many people meet in life and probably meet somebody that could have been the one, but they met at the wrong time. Yeah. And um, I think it just happened that we both were ready at the right time. And it's just... It's... I think... I was talking to my colleague today, and, and she's in a similar state. She's in a nice relationship. And she says, it's just so different to not have mind games... It's the to effortless. not have that kind of roller coaster yeah. of emotions, that's to so just good. feel nice, and that's that word would have sounded boring to me yeah. twenty years ago. Yeah, but actually, it's nice. Oh my it's God. just really nice. Mm. Yeah, it's the I intense. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I didn't believe it to be honest, because uh, I've always had a relationship to have been like, up there, or down mm-hmm. here, and up there, and down here, you know. <clears throat> The first one relationship I had long term, because I've only had quite long term relationships, it was, it was fine. It was, it was really nice. It was just we were young. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it was just a young thing. It wasn't love. Yeah. It was just, you know. Um, the second one was just a, it was a mess. It was a little mess. We shouldn't have been with each other. <coughs> and as far as I'm concerned, this is what relationships were like. Was, yeah, I, you I was, get used I, to I, it, yeah, don't you? I was, I was just, it, it's, I was like, relationships a bit long in this category of, you do this, you do that, you do, you do it together, you get, you know, you 
whatever, and it was just, it didn't, didn't work. And then I met, I said, I met Emma, and it just, just turned on its head, and I just said, it, it was just mm. nice. Yeah, I it think was, that it was well, more than nice. I can it's it's mutual respect on and on and on. as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and nice makes it sound again, no, I agree. but nice it's, is it's wonderful. Love that word now. It's nice and it's it's content and it's it's simple. It's simple and it's relaxing yeah. and it's just and it's equal. It's cozy. Yeah, I get and it. And it's, it's just, sustaining. It's sustaining and it's it's nice to be listened to and respected. And your opinion matters. Yeah. And some of you actually takes an interest. Yeah. And I think it's not just after their own agenda. The, 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 these little stories, I think they're great for like anybody who's listening. I think it's it's uh, who who are struggling and lonely or wanting to find somebody and they're getting that they're at a certain age or even if they're younger. It's you know. I just think I don't know, it's not one to say fairy tale, but I do think it's that everyday miracle. It's not yeah, fairy tale. It, it, people, it's, people don't. Yeah. You know, don't realise there is. When people say there's there are so many for everybody out yeah. there, you know, there's, yeah. there is, there, yeah. there's so many people in the world. But what Kerry said is, is right, you have to know your worth. And don't get me wrong, you like, have to the know other that. thing is, I've always preached, I use the word preach, it's probably not a good word to use when I'm talking about therapy because we're not there to preach, but I've always advocated that at times we have to really explore our pattern behaviour. I'm sure you do exactly the same, you know, where we explore almost like genographic, let's go back to the your experience with your family, let's look at conflictual, close fused, all of those relationships and then explore how that's impacted on the rest of your life. And to some degree, like I would have sworn by that. And then I met Pete and Yes, I completely acknowledge that I had worked on myself and that I'd become what I think was my best version mm-hmm. of me for at least that point. But man, you know, <laughs> he hadn't worked on himself. He came out of a destructive relationship. Mm-hmm. I had only ever had like kind of like really mediocre or less than what I would consider adult relationships. And yet, boom, I'm in a relationship where it all works mm-hmm. and it's not hard work and we just get it. That's the thing, it's way. not hard work. Yeah, that's, that's the it key, is. it's not hard work. But at the same time, that blew to smithereens, this idea for me that everything was based on pattern behaviour. Like, well, you just, because actually what I realised as well was, it's based on look. It's oh, based on God, yes. one person making a phone call to me at a time. It's based on me responding. It's based on the text message that interjected. It's based on me... Propos- All of those things you know, It's based on yeah. me propositioning him for sex. That's the truth, you know? Because actually that could have just ended up on a one-night stand because I was a single mum. I didn't get sex very often. Saw a single guy. Thought, I may as well have sex with him. Not that that is something I would consistently do, but certainly I was attracted to him. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought, why go on a date? Might not get on. Then he definitely won't get sex. So let's just ask him for sex. Make sure it's all about sex. Then you get sex. I didn't have a B game. Do you understand? <laughs> I didn't have a, a B yeah. game. I had absolutely... An a game. Love the air game. <laughs> oh, no. But the point is, what I'm saying is that that showed yeah. me something beautiful, which is it's quite the, the, it's like quite the sliding doors. Of, of it is. Really, and everything it? slides indoors. Yeah. Yeah, everything hey, slides you know. indoors. But when you just said about people listening, then I, I had I've got a very wise friend who um, is Greek and has gone back to live in Greece now, and she's brilliant for advice. And I remember her saying to me once when I think she was still thinking that you know. You're going through trouble in your marriage, but maybe it could work. Maybe it could work out. And she said, she didn't know the full picture. She didn't know what was really going on. Nobody did. And um, she said to me once, you know what? Relationships are hard. If you're happier more days than you're unhappy, yes. you're on to a, you're all right. Yeah. You're doing okay. And I remember thinking at one time, and this was really early on, and I was like, okay, I'm probably just about happier more days than I'm unhappy and then it got to probably about equal and then I remember one day thinking I'm miserable yeah like the majority of days yeah and I actually should have got out then yeah. well actually no on reflection I shouldn't because I wouldn't have had my little girl I wouldn't change that for the world no. um but actually you know that's I was unhappy and that for people listening if there's people listening who are unhappy yeah more than they are happy I agree you really need, you deserve, you deserve something else because there is something better. Even if you're on your own, it's better. I was happier on my own 
yeah. than in oh, that I relationship. Was so much happier. So much happier. But I also think that, you know, when you're working, particularly in a field like ours, I mean, even you, Pete, you worked with young people with massive problems, you know, much like we've worked with various individuals with their own issues. But I do think that you kind of have this, like, blueprint where it's all about fixing people and when you meet people in relationships well there are a couple of things that happen like firstly if you're a practitioner like us mm -hmm. and you kind of get people it's really quick that you can get people attaching to you because yeah. you just kind of want to care and yeah. that's something that's sometimes quite new for those individuals yeah. but then at the same point you have this like durable belief that you want to make people better and to some degree that's a personal issue that I have and it's not about I mean, other people it's my problem I want to make people better but actually you need a willing participant and also you need to not necessarily always be patronizing as I've just sounded there because I get that you know yeah. but it's that kind of desire to correct or to enable. And I genuinely would see broken and be like, oh, but if they did this, they could do yeah. that. They could. And then you go automatically into a scenario where you're resented because one, you're trying to drive them yeah. and they don't want to be driven, or you do make better lives for them and then they don't want to be grateful and you feel resentment for them because they don't see your worth, and then you spend half your life dealing with unreasonable. And it's also what is fixed. Yes, and you're because right. Because this is something that I face day in, day in with yeah, my right. job, is that sometimes I have days where I just think, what is it all about? Yeah. I don't feel like I'm having any impact. I don't think I'm changing anything. Um, I've got a few people that have made recently in my work made a huge impact on me because I think that they really have done so amazingly well. Yeah, and you do. And they've work changed people. their lives around. And it's and so you work, evident. You know, for people who haven't met Kerry and for people who don't know Kerry, um, and this is your first instance, go on Britain's Darkest Taboos, the first two series, because Kerry is there and is brilliant. And you'll get to know a little bit more about her work. But Kerry is a practitioner who works with, you know, high-level dangerous criminals and always manages to see the best of humanity in spite of that so it would be worth kind of checking out dr kerry nixon on twitter and also catching up with things like britain's darkest taboo she's also on countdown to murder and quite a few other documentaries so have a look because it'll give you a good impression as to why she's talking about all of this stuff to do yeah. with forensic psychology yeah absolutely but on fundamentally i've got an interest in i also have you know, private clients yeah. getting over phobia or yeah. anxiety or depression or relationships. Hashtag, wait here, we're starting a clinic. Yes. <laughs> that's and, um, real. <laughs> yeah, that's actually that, happening. That is happening. And, but I, I realised that actually some of the people that I think I'm not fixing. Yes. And one patient recently said to me, you can add me to your list of people you fixed. And, yes. and it, he'll never realise how much that, that letter meant to oh me. Oh my God, yeah. Um, but then for people that I think I haven't, actually what my idea is fi yes. of fixed is and what their idea of fixed yes. is, it can be a little change that means that they're not self-harming anymore. Butterfly effect. It changes everything. It, and it could be that to me I might not even see it, but to them... It's huge. It's huge. Mm. I, I, when I used to train people in mentoring, so like I used to run my pupil referral units and do the social psychology of all of that and the therapeutic interaction there and train adult mentors to kind of mentor kids who have severe criminal issues and one of the things that I used to do within training was kind of explore like how to be an effective mentor and safeguarding and all of those issues but one of the things that they used to struggle with is I would give a lecture and I would say your job is not to make them the prime minister or even to exactly. stop them being a criminal your job is to teach them not to hit their wife as hard yeah. and they used to take that sharp intake of breath and see it as an insulting context it wasn't what i was trying to get across was whatever your positive impact is as tiny as that may feel when you see it effect wise yeah. it has made a difference like you know as well as I do. What is it, the statistics, like 70% of people who are in UK adult prisons have been sexually abused. Yep. We don't want to tell that story. And don't get me wrong, you know more than I do about this, Kerry. You know that there are reprehensible individuals who are despicable, dangerous, and should never see the light of day. They are rare. They are rare. The yeah. biggest story, 
bigger story and the one that no one wants to hear is that actually prisons are full of broken young people and young men and young women who grow into broken adults who have had horrible lives and the rhetoric and narrative that's told there no one wants to hear because who wants to feel sorry for a murderer but actually and we don't you, when they do you that see yeah. that every, every single day. day every day i see it every day and I, I i look at so many of the people i work with and think if they'd got help and were taken out of what you they were in. You talk about attachment, don't you, all oh, the time? Attachment is, you talked about sexual abuse, that's huge, mm. but actually something that I see in every single and person. And very underrepresented. So it's attachment, and people, I remember once a, a Twitter comment, because I'd mentioned mm. about attachment on a documentary, and I got, you get a lot of negative comments. Yeah, of course. And somebody's like, what's she going on about? Attachment, boo-hoo, as if that. People who have got secure attachment, can't it's like we've talked before about it. how a man can't talk about being a woman and you can't yes. talk about being a black person. Yes. If you've had attachment, you can't possibly understand what mm -hmm. it's like to not have I don't understand what it's like not to have attachment. Yes, I don't. And but I work with people, I work with people who have never had another human say I love you. I try to imagine when you say the word attachment in my head, I instantly see a picture of one boat with an anchor and one just fucking getting battered by the waves. Yes. Yeah. It is, literally. And, they, and, and often, when there's no attachment, there is that as well. They're being physically beaten. Exactly. So they might be left, neglected, yeah, even, but they're yeah. also being abused. Yeah, that adds so they've that also level. got the, the, the neuro damage as well, because yeah. their brain's being battered every day. I mean, like you think of like a piece of plasticine, a child's brain is basically scrunch it up into a ball, yeah. knead it a bit, Look so, at the plasticine, so that's the brain. And, and it's the, been damaged. And the impact of things like neglect, you yeah. can actually physically see it. I mean, like, it's terrifying when you look at the mm. size of a neglected yeah. brain versus the size of a connected, connected. attached yeah. brain. Yeah. Imagine never, ever having a parent or a loved one. It doesn't have to be a biological. That's the thing that was wrong with whole Bowlby's theory, really, and, and kind of the 70s social work movement was that, you know, it didn't have to be. Mm. The biological parent, it, a, attachment can be given Care by giver. a caregiver. Yeah. Somebody that says, I love you, looks after you, you know they're there for you. If you've never had that from anyone, literally never had it. And I work with people who've done horrible things, but they have never, ever had. I remember one guy saying, he's never been kissed by a female, including... Mm. Parents, grandparents, aunties, never. Nobody. You can't um, kind of, it gives you an insight into why people wouldn't give a shit. Because yes. if you have never felt value of relationships, if you've never felt valued as a human, how can you seek to value others around you? So and don't get me wrong, lots of people can go through the most heinous experiences and actually what it does is it makes them covet being better and doing better for people but for those who can't you just imagine the impact that that would have and often with the people who when people say all the time and that's another comments i've got on social media when if i talk about the backgrounds of somebody who's done something bad they go well i've been through that and i came out and i and i totally agree with that what you often find when you dig a bit deeper is that there was somebody. Yes. It might have been their best mate's parent yes. or their football coach yes. or their teacher, but they had a glimpse I get it. of some form totally. of attachment by somebody. Yeah. Or a dog. A dog, yeah. yeah. Or something. Yeah. And that's often the difference. And it's a massive difference. Huge difference. A huge difference. I've worked with, I did a lot of work with gangs and um, I worked with a lot of gang members and I remember one guy saying to me that he spent most of his time at his best mate's house because his mum fed them, you know? And interestingly, he did end up in a gang, but he was also a very moral, <laughs> moral gang member. Oh, there was a massive morality in the, It was, yeah, he, was he, he only offended against other, and not that I'm not justifying, I'm not minimising, he, he offended against other criminals. Yeah. He, he, he was never a domestic abuse perpetrator. He never offended against strangers yeah. or females. It was in the context, it was in of, the context of, of what he yeah. called his business. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was because he'd had that experience with... But that's the whole mafia yeah. experience, exactly. isn't it? You know what I mean? It's yeah. a job, we yeah. do it because of. Exactly. But I, I think attachment is one of those areas. I think, I genuinely think that we're going to have to have you on again because we've well gone past our hour. 
We have. But, but it's, it's, I would I'm, love I'm to have you on. I'm sorry, it was And we didn't even finish no. how we got into Frozen we're Psychology. We kind of just started actually, there and went well, around the world. Part, part, one. <laughs> part one. This is, this, we're going to actually end that by saying part one with Kerry Nixon, Dr. I'm Kerry sorry. Nixon, because there's absolutely no way we're going to let you get away with that whole attachment thing. That's going to be the next podcast that we do but first of all thank you for uh, coming and speaking to us and secondly thank you for being so open because one of the things that we really want to do in this podcast is to kind of humanise people who are seen on TV and who are experts and leaders in their field but are also just ordinary human beings living lives and struggling like the rest of us and it really kind of brings that shade to the recognition that it doesn't matter how qualified you are we're always human and we're always learning and we're always growing on that note, just on that, I think that's actually, unlike you, I think, who's been very open for a long time, it's, that's the thing that's quite hard for me <laughs> in this way. I'm still very like, I, I can't really talk about things like that. Um, but that's been a recent kind of change in my mindset recently. It was like, actually, no, I need to be. I remember um, in relation to something that happened to me in my relationship, a colleague of mine once saying, we well, can't talk about that. Because that will um, discredit you as a, as a oh, no. professional. And I remember thinking, the really? The opposite. Really, will it? And actually, again, I had a conversation with a colleague today. And I was telling her, no, it makes us better. It does. It makes the more that we're open and share. The more honest. The more, more honest authentic, you are. The more it, congruent. Yeah. The more we give permission to other yeah. people to do the same. I would think yeah. we might have a part three and a part four and a it part five. It might be five. good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kerry might just become a regular on the podcast. We might just stop calling her a guest and start saying that she's actually just part of it. <laughs> Thank you for coming and sharing. It's welcome. Us. It's amazing. Make sure you subscribe. And also tune in for our next. I've got a sore neck though. Next time I'm sitting there. That's right. Can't <laughs> like that. We'll let you do that. You're the guest. <laughs> Take care, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye.